Vicksburg surrounded by Grant. This is before Grant had a good reputation, but it was building up. Uh, but taking Vicksburg sort of makes his reputation. Um, it's defended by a general who is sent out there to um, refresh his reputation, recently promoted to lieutenant general. Um, and uh, Grant, of course, is worried that uh, Pemberton's boss, Johnston, might come relieve the siege. Um, another message was uh, captured a uh, day or two before this one was attempting to get in through the water gate uh, from the outside to the inside. Um, and the question is, uh, if we can break it, would this have changed history? The day this message was being delivered, um, Pemberton surrendered to Grant to save his men's life. He was under his orders to defend to the last man. Okay. He was no idiot. about 7 o'clock, and there are a few more people probably come in a few minutes, but uh, how many are going to go to the Cambridge Brewery afterwards? So it's one, two, three, four, ah. four guys. You going, Bill? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. I'll take a count. I, I've got a mucking early meeting with too many vice presidents in the morning. <coughs> I'd like think. to mention that our, uh, we, in our upcoming meetings uh, next month, uh, Dick and Joe Miller are going to be talking about uh, usability issues. Okay. With, Dick um, and Joe, great. He's going to be uh, using a program called uh, Photox as, a, uh, as an example. And in November, we're uh, uh, Chuck Anderson uh, from Worcester Polytech is going to be talking about rolling out uh, IPv6. And we also have our install fest uh, at the beginning of December, on December 3rd. For many of you, this may be the first time you've seen a Perl 6 program um, uh, or seen one run. Um, but it, uh, this uh, embeds a copy of the cryptogram. Um, and. Uh, basically does a, a Kaziski um, coincidence count uh, to find at what offset is the most frequent repeat. Uh, so it's a um, uh, consider sort of like a Fourier transform. What's the frequency spike in this text? Um, and it says that the frequency spike in this text, ignoring the word breaks, is 15. So we assume um, this is a uh, polyalphabetic Vigineer cipher with period 15, because that's the sort of thing the, uh, uh, that was considered unbreakable by the Confederates. Uh, the Union had a couple of guys in the old executive office building that did not consider it unbreakable. And Lincoln hung out in their office instead of his office <laughs> um, because uh, the telegraph was in the OEB, which was the new executive office building then, uh, and uh, as were the two cryptographers, and he would get um, messages from his generals decoded, and messages from the Confederates to each other decoded, and they'd hand one copy to the general and one copy to the president, um, you know, much like the situation room downstairs today. And they would have done this at the same calculation to find the period. Um, so we'll use 15. <coughs> I need to. Uh, 
notorious. Yeah, I think there. We don't want that. Um, and I've written this. Oh. <laughs> once. Only need it once. Um, written this command um, where we have to give it a hint of either what the key is or what the key length is. And we can play with word breaks or not, but they've given us word breaks, which makes cracking this much easier. Um, if we have time, I can show you what it's like uh, uh, to crack it uh, without word breaks. I wrote this program um, to let me play with a, uh, a Vigineer cipher. The first thing we do is look for the gold letters, which are one letter words. Mm -hmm. The word space, the word breaks are the red green transitions. Red for stop, green for go, right? Uh, so the amber is a one letter word, which has got to be either A or I. Um, and we just look at the letters appearing in the uh, other places that would have the same key letter, assuming the 15. And um, the, uh, I don't like that Z down there, um, so maybe it's the I. And we'll go over and try this one. A. We get another Z. That's not so good. We get an X, but look at that. We get E's um, all over the place. Um, um, and a, uh, another I picked up on the same key letter. And the key letter uh, is an E, which makes it sound like it might be a pronounceable key. That's good. Um, we're happy. So th those are our first two keys. And we've got a two-letter word starting with N. How many two-letter words starting with N are there in English? One. No. We'll try that. Anybody any good at crosswords? Now, do you remember any words from the introductory text I showed you? Where is this happening? Who's involved? <laughs> Vicksburg is on the... Mississippi, yeah. General Pemberton, and General Grant. And the Mississippi is a... River. River, River is a five-letter word with V in the middle. We have a five-letter word with V in the middle. <coughs> Let's see if it fits. <laughs> and we're basically almost there. It's interesting that BLU is part of the uh, key. Hmm? From? Fill in the G for general there. And they used the key Manchester Bluff through most of the war. So the guys in the OEB only had to crack it once and then try it. <laughs> yeah. they, they finally changed it. Um, If we uh, edit, copy, now, if we don't have word breaks, which would have been the competent thing for them to do. Um, we'd have to take our, um, nope, got to hit insert to go in, not overwrite mode. Um, we just take our expected word and try it everywhere. Um, and 
this doesn't get everywhere because I'm missing some spots, but it makes it easy. Um, and it's, um, you know, and it's going to take us forever to get there, so we'll just cheat a little. That wasn't there. <coughs> Yeah. And then it starts popping out. Well, you just drag that expected word through, and eventually you get things that look like English in the rest of the message, and things that look like English in the key, and you're in. Yeah. Without the word breaks. And this, this probable word crib, like you crib a quiz, you crib a cryptanalysis. Yeah. Okay. Well, the probable word crib is one of the 17 techniques used in breaking enigma. It took all 17. You can't just use this and, you know, we, we just used the Kaczynski coincidence and the crib, and we're in here. Um, the, uh, now they could have made it harder, they could have scrambled the alphabets in their table, but, you know, this, this is just uh, stuff that was, uh, you know, mostly known um, in, in uh, previous centuries and had been forgotten. The uh, problem is the diplomats couldn't train other diplomats to use fancy stuff, so they used um, uh, codes with a simple super encipherment. Um, and thought they were secure because the, on the rare occasion they had somebody in their government who could break them, they wouldn't listen to them anyway. Uh, so that when uh, impractical people invented and figured out how to crack this in the uh, uh, Renaissance, if that information was forgotten, had to be uh, rediscovered. Now, uh, with modern um, artificial intelligence techniques of um, hill climbing optimization or um, uh, branch and prune search, uh, a, a modern uh, Moore's Law empowered computer um, could, with a heuristic of, gee, that looks more like English than it used to, uh, work its way through the entire key space. Um, without checking every option, because it would only uh, check things, try things that made it better. So just start at a random point and make random changes in the direction that gets better, uh, so you can uh, constrain the search space. So that any cipher um, that doesn't have every bit of key changing every bit of output um, is now computer searchable. So lots of things that were considered impractical uh, to break, which most of them became practical once you had IBM offline card accounting machines. It would take days to break them. And now, 20 minutes. I think the issue back before we really had portable machines to do this, you know, you can, it, it just took a long time to even encode and decode something. Yeah. And, and with, without a computer to help you, yeah. um, a secure system hmm. um, is going to take a long time and be very error prone. Um, and you have to be very careful to uh, burn your scrap paper and scatter the ashes problem with using a computer to help you is you now have to burn your computer and scatter the ashes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and you know, having a uh, encrypted partition on your hard drive would be a crime in some countries. So there's lots of issues. Are any of the European countries currently 
for the bills that the district requested uh, partitions? Um, there has been some confusion on this issue. <laughs> Okay. Um, the, 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 not set right there, actually. Well, the, the, the problem is that what uh, the French mandate was supposed to say and what turned up in the English translation uh, was different. So they weren't being quite as idiotic as it sounded. Um, people were interpreting what they were saying as every key must be given to the government um, and everything you do through your ISP must be saved forever. And all they really meant was um, the ISP needs to keep a secure backup copy of changed passwords and a secure backup copy of the logs, of the logging logs. Um, but the, uh, if you do a word-for-word -word translation of idiomatic French into English, the idiomatic English meaning of all something or other is different, a and people, or you know, e equivalent linguistic problems. Um, and so, uh, you know, the EU probably shouldn't use Google Translate for official documents. <laughs> make, make work for um, graduates of uh, Heidelberg and the Monterey Institute. I'm really interested in uh, making work for translators since I may wind up with one of the fun ones. So. Best career idea the kids had in a while. <laughs> Daughter keeps threatening to uh, run off and get a quickie license. No, 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 no. Take your time. You know, get engaged later, married a lot after that, you know. But kids. Let's see, where's the part of the uh, PGP background or the uh, other cryptography news lately. Uh, RSA had a um, cyber break in, and the um, files containing the secret constants for all the little hard tokens that people had on their keychains got uh, compromised. So those devices are like dead. All the key fobs at RSA, or what model? Any one of them? Like, um, I, have yeah, geez, yeah. I have one of those. Is that the it, it, it is a collector's item. As of when? Today? As of this summer. Anybody who expects you to actually still use it for any secure operations is an idiot. Which means it'll be years before it actually gets to the guys. <coughs> yeah. Yes. But it, 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 it is. Um, uh, well, there are some uh, companies that don't really care about security, but they uh, they have to implement it for uh, regulatory reasons. And, and it so takes a while. And it takes a while to rip things out in some and replace them in some place. Well, my company was just bought by IBM, and I think that RSA keys are going to go away for real fast. Yeah. Well, oh, congratulations. Um, I haven't read the article, but there's uh, some. A uh, wicked spiffy flaw in the latest uh, Mac OS X release yeah, right about that makes the um, hashes of the uh, passwords um, trivial in some sense. Uh, I haven't looked at it. Um, that's bad news. Come on, Apple. And you can also change the password of the user that you logged in as without requiring a password. Oh, that's even better. <laughs> um, so then, if you can do that, then you can run sudo if the person's in a relationship. Wonderful. Some, um, some Iranian hacker has uh, compromised two uh, RSA certificate authorities. Um, this is RSA, the algorithm, not the company. Uh, the, the people that you get the search to use with your HTTPS. 
um, the people whose root certificate is embedded in your browser. Um, two of them have been compromised by attacks on their Windows networks or their PHP web servers or whatever, and leveraging the way through from the front door deep into the bowels of the company. Um, and in one case, uh, issued a few bogus certificates for star.google.com, but uh, in the DigiNotar attack, um, issued star.star.com to himself. <laughs> is perfect if you're going to uh, be a set up a man in the middle uh, in the Iranian state um, ISP. Um, DigiNotar has filed for bankruptcy. They basically got given an internet death sentence. All major browsers and operating systems yank trust of their root cert um, out of the product. Apple was the last to get around to do it. Um, although it took w Windows took two tries to get all of them, um, and there, there's combine that with a known flaw in the TLS protocol that HTTPS uses to use these SSL certificates, um, and there's a. Um, small little Java Trojan horse that can be used uh, to set up a man in the middle without um, without being the ISP. But of course, um, if you set up a wireless access point that says free internet or Linksys <laughs> in your bedroom, you can be man in the middle to your neighbors. Um, or, you know, pretend to be free Wi-Fi in the coffee shop. Um, Friday there's going to be a new um, uh, Trojan horse that attacks PayPal um, and works with S the SSL TLS. Uh, it'll, it'll be announced, but it, it looks pretty bad. Um, the, the key takeaway is do not use any account you really, really care about via somebody else's Wi-Fi even if you're using HTTPS. You know, if, if there's any chance you're not the most computer savvy person within Wi-Fi range, um, only use Wi-Fi you control or is run by somebody you trust, namely, you know, your boss. That's the is news. SSH also got priced? No, SSH does not use the TLS protocol. See, it's, it's 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 not it's not the underlying crypto that's the problem. What is it? The in almost all cases, um, breaks of known, tried and tested um, algorithms are either because there's something wrong in the protocol of exchanging bits and numbers for the algorithms to work on, um, or um, the implementation of the algorithm, either in C or by people on the, uh, in the radio room of a destroyer. In the old crypto, people had to do the encryption by hand and they had to set the indicator numbers and set the initial setup on the Enigma machine, right? Um, and that people protocol was frequently shortcutted, and those shortcuts, the operator figures it's getting encrypted. The, nobody will ever know that I took a shortcut. Well, if the people at Bletchley Park guess that you might take shortcuts and look for evidence you're taking shortcuts, they'll find out you're taking shortcuts. And if the Army Security Agency is looking over your shoulder at what you're transmitting. Um, they may come in and smack you around for taking shortcuts. And the difference between our signal security in World War II and the German signal security in World War II is our ASA was really diligent about keeping an eye on what crypto clerks and radio operators were doing and making sure they played by the book and um, didn't send test traffic um, with uh, classified equipment and 
uh, didn't use their girlfriend's name as the indicator and didn't use the same indicator twice in the same day and yada yada yada. Um, the Germans were aware of this and didn't invest the manpower in doing it. Because they felt their system was good enough and the Brits couldn't possibly be crazy enough to invest the manpower would take to break it. Not knowing that the Poles had given them an early entry into an earlier version of the system, so they only needed to do a little bit of catch-up each time the Germans improved it. Next lesson, incremental improvement of a crypto system, incremental improvement of your operating procedures is only good if people haven't noticed and started figuring you out yet. If somebody's already in your system, incremental improvement may not be enough. Mm -hmm. um, so even the, the one-time pad is theoretically unbreakable. If you have a list of random letters that really are random, and you only have two copies of it, one for the guy sending, one for the guy receiving, and as you use each line of letters, you scratch it out so you can't accidentally reuse it. And when you finish the page, you burn it. Um, and you use like the Vigineer polyalphabetic table to combine that with your message. So using that as an infinitely long key instead of the repeating key that we used, uh, that we broke earlier, that is theoretically um, unbreakable um, as long as you, you know, get rid of the word breaks. If we can guess where all the A's and the I's are, well, we've got anyway. Um, you know, the, the word river won't help you there because the key doesn't repeat. You can't tell. The key is gibberish and it doesn't repeat. So you can find river everywhere and can't tell which one is real, if any. So theoretically unbreakable. In the unclassified literature, it's been broken at least twice. Um, the, a, an Englishman uh, who was a printing hardware salesman had a brilliant idea. And the English foreign office wasn't interested in buying. But he sold it to the Germans. Uh, he took the uh, numbering machines that went in letterpress presses, which are like little odometers made out of steel. Um, and every time um, it prints a number, um, the uh, one wheel like an odometer turns, and it'll print the next number. And after the wheel is turned 10 times, the next wheel turns one just like an odometer. And you can set it to advance every third stroke instead of every one stroke if you need to make three copies. Well, he, he took the design for those, which were standard Victorian printing hardware, and you can still find them in uh, specialty letterpress shops for your uh, form numbering jobs. You print everything else, offset or Xerox, and then just number it. Uh, he rejiggered them uh, so that uh, different wheels had the numbers in different orders, and um, all the wheels turned some of the time, and they carried more often uh, so that they were like random. Well. These weren't random enough for a mathematician. Uh, and uh, during World War II, the US Army, using IBM punch cards, um, detected um, the pattern and worked backwards and figured out what the pattern of the wheels and the gearings were <coughs> from the patterns and the number from the statistics. Um, and when they finally captured copies of the stuff, they said, yep, got it. <laughs> um, they collected radio messages during the war between the Russians and their spies. Even though they were our allies, we were still spying on them. And they were spying on us. Um, and they couldn't break them. They figured it was a one-time pad. Um, but they, they kept copies, and it was all, you know, 
they got it all card punched and they were doing the offline statistics on the big machines with the plug board wiring to program it uh, that were called accounting machines back then. And they detected that certain messages um, sort of match certain other messages such that they probably were in the same key. And if you can find two messages that have the same running key, um, whether it's a book key or a random key or whatever, you can subtract them um, and the key disappears and you then have uh, one Russian message being encoded by the other Russian message. Um, and you can work that back and forth like we could have guessed that Chester was Manchester uh, when we're doing the break instead of continuing to work uh, in the message. Um, and what they eventually realized was in the basement of Lubyanka prison, KGB headquarters, or the GRU's equivalent, there was a printing plant where people were told to set random type uh, in a chaise for a printing press, random numbers, and print only two copies, and then distribute the type back into the type cases and start over again. And the Soviet workers with this job were just printers. They weren't given any cryptography instruction. And standard Soviet attitude, they pretend to pay us, we pretend to work. They printed many more than two copies of a given page because it seemed absolutely stupid to only print two if we needed to produce 400 pages a day. Um, it was utter stupidity if you had no mathematical or cryptographic training, which the printer didn't. Um, basic violation of protocol, basic violation of supervision. Um, it took us you know, 10 years to get the you know, spare time of Army Security Agency people uh, toward the end of the war when Germany was defeated, uh, Japan was nearing defeat, uh, Japan was basically all connected by landlines, so there was no radio to messages to catch anymore. So there was nothing to do except go look at these old Russian messages again. All, all those IBM machines <laughs> we bought for the rest of the war were now available. <laughs> Kim Philby, MI6 manager, was over visiting his counterparts in the US and gets a look at one of the messages they're decrypting and realizes they're very close to figuring out that his gut buddy, Guy Burgess, is uh, one of um, the Soviet spies in Britain, which means that they'll probably catch him next. And so he goes back to England, uh, grabs Burgess, and they fly to Moscow. And he gets pissed when he finds out that no, uh, his uh, pension at the rank of colonel does not mean he's now a colonel. Idiot. Um, so, you know, how you use it, how you code the code that uses the algorithm, how the people use it, how we do the key signing tonight, uh, it is the way into most of these things. There are some things where just, you know, Moore's law or a basic mathematical breakthrough will destroy it. Encryptions based on the knapsack algorithm uh, were destroyed when uh, a shortcut to the solution of the knapsack problem was found. The original public key crypto, uh, where you can split the key into a public half and a private half, which is what we're doing with the PGP key signing tonight, uh, used the knapsack algorithm. That was the original hard problem to used for the trapdoor function. Um, turned out there was a shortcut around that one. So they said, okay, it's got to be NP hard, it's got to be um, something that if somebody makes the breakthrough that makes it trivial, um, 
it may be bad for this encryption, but it's really great for the entire rest of mathematics, <coughs> which was not the case with the knapsack problem. Which, which is why elliptic curves and um, prime factorization are uh, the techniques that are used today. When you created the keys for the key signing tonight, you had to choose either a DSA key or an RSA key. Uh, and th those are uh, either RSA are all uh, uh, prime numbers of certain forms form a uh, multiply together to form a composite, and you have the modulus, and that's where the arithmetic's done. Mm -hmm. Elliptic curves are a, a weirder form of math that is you know, similarly hard to work backwards, discrete logarithms. You can take the logarithm of a number, of a regular number, uh, when you're working with the real numbers, and it's, you know, it's basically as easy to take the logarithm as it is to take the power. But if you're doing clock arithmetic, um, the, uh, where the answer of an exponent going around the clock, you don't know how many times you've gone around the clock, you just know what the fraction um, on the clock face is. Um, taking a logarithm of that number to find out how many times you went around isn't going to happen. It's not that it's hard, it's it's impossible. There are too many possible values. So that, that's intrinsically one way. Sort of hashing. Well, there, are, there are bigger spaces uh, that still have the one-wayness without the loss of information. Uh, that's where uh, the, the discrete logarithm and the elliptic curves get their math. Yeah. Before we do the signing, we should take a look at... Uh, I'll send some of these links to the list afterwards. The, uh, happily, that's the one I want. Swipe this deck off the uh, off the internet. You're probably uh, using GPG as opposed to PGP. GPG is the GNU implementation of Zimmerman's Pretty Good Privacy. Uh, pretty Good Privacy was uh, a commercial product uh, with a, a freeware uh, cut rate version, and GPG is the uh, free and open source floss of Work alike, and uh, they're actually interoperable. The uh, th these are general purpose tools for encryption, but also for non repudiation. Non repudiation is where signatures come in. Um, you can prove somebody actually signed this, that the owner of this key must have signed this message because only the owner of the key could have uh, uh, made this signature, and therefore they must have uh, sent it, and we have this chain of trust that says uh, Jerry used to own this key. Unless Jerry has repudiated the key, he can't repudiate the message. So if you do lose control of your key, you do need to publicly announce someplace that, that you're, you're repudiating the key. Otherwise, uh, somebody could uh, fake on you. Um, but in order to do this checking, uh, that the um, that it was signed, or in order to um, address a message to somebody far away, there needs to be a, uh, a trusted repository um, for uh, trusted copies of the public halves of the keys. That's what the red thing says. Um, now the uh, and that, that's what you know. All of the certificates that are built into your browser. Um, are doing. There's a list of certificate authorities um, that are trusted by Mozilla and Chrome and Internet Explorer, uh, Windows, Safari, Mac OS. Um, each of them has their own list. 
and they issue uh, the certificates to the websites that have the little walker, the little key, and they issue certificates to uh, subsidiary uh, issuers, like uh, many companies have an in-house uh, certificate authority that is using a subsidiary CA key uh, that they bought from VeriSign or whoever. Um, and that, that's the commercial world way of setting up a web of trust uh, with some uh, specific trusted root nodes. And Komodo and DigiNotar were two of them that got compromised. And the Iranian hacker claims that he has access to half a dozen more. One of them has temporarily suspended operations while they uh, uh, check to see what besides their website was compromised. Um, how many more he actually has his fingers in, we don't know. Any of them that are running Windows, well. In the open source world, um, and in the crypto anarchist world, uh, the idea of having a hierarchy of trust is a bad thing because somebody can subvert the root of the hierarchy and own or destroy everything. See the DigiNotar. Um, so instead of a tree of trust, uh, we use a web of trust where um, if you just swap keys, handing them to each other to somebody you have known for years in the real world, um, you know, several of these guys I've seen here for 10, 15 years. And they've always used the same name. There's some reason to believe that they believe each other. And, um, that may be good enough for me to take a key from one of them for checking messages between us when we're not here. Um, but that may not be enough trust for me to accept a digital introduction to somebody else um, by somebody claiming to be them with that key. I might want more trust than that. So the Zimmerman and the other ringleaders in the PGP um, came up with a way um, to extend trust to people um, that you don't know. Uh, key signing parties are part of extending the web of trust. Um, people prepare their keys um, and uh, a way is created where uh, the list of uh, key fingerprints of everybody that's involved um, and their name um, can be distributed and a way for the actual keys to be handled which is much too complex to handle in person because they're you know, big hunks of bits. So a server is used for that. Um, but this serves as the uh, out of band human intelligence check that what's on the server matches uh, what should be there. And that's an important check. Um, if I upload a key tonight that isn't on this list, you shouldn't sign it. <laughs> Because you don't know if it was me that uploaded it or somebody watching the video claiming to be me. But if somebody um, <coughs> like uh, John Abru, 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 which you know isn't the name I know you by, I just know you as Jabber, and it doesn't say well it says Jabber Blue here, so th there is a Jabber there. So I guess I can believe that that's you. If uh, if the guy answering to that name says that this PID <coughs> and fingerprint is the one he wants you to sign in meet space here and now, um, and you get sufficient proof here and now that he really is who he says he is, then you can take this piece of paper um, home with you um, and check that the key he uploaded to the server yesterday, or last week, uh, matches the key ID and fingerprint. And I'll transfer the trust that you have from meeting him, shaking his hand, checking his paperwork, and everybody else here vouching that, yeah, he's who he says he is, 
um, and apply that trust to the key that you get off the server. Can we trust the server? Doesn't he have to say what his key is or that it's correct on the sheet or mm -hmm. something or on the server? Yeah, it's, that's part of the process. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah you, you, ha you have to verify the server only has the keys that the paper that you've checked off on the paper that you want to do and only do the ones and you have enough information to identify the keys here. And he says that the keys are correct on the and, paper. And everybody that's listed here needs to affirm that their key listed here is indeed listed correctly and Jerry didn't intentionally or unintentionally introduce errors um, possibly through my having uploaded a key claiming to be Federico last night. Oh, I did that last week. <laughs> in practice, what you do is that when you're doing the signing, you import by the first column the PID, which is short mm -hmm. type, and then you look at the fingerprint in your key ring, uh -huh. which is the second one, and you check that the fingerprint matches. And so you have a cryptographic assurance that the key wasn't tampered with. That's, that's when you're signing at home tonight or tomorrow or the weekend. And in meet space here and now, um, the, uh, <coughs> we will read down the list. And to verify that all of the sheets of the paper are the same, we will read at least the key IDs aloud, and the owners will match the fingerprints. I just to use myself as an example, uh, <coughs> if you look at email I've sent to the list, uh, you notice my key ID and fingerprint is in my signature. Okay. There could still be a man in the middle attack. No, the, the beautiful thing about the cryptographic caches yeah. is the software you use on your computer <coughs> will verify that the key ID, the key you download with the key ID, um, matches, um, let's see, Dominique Tulu is rather unsettling. Um, okay, here's the, here, here's the list. This key ID is assigned by the server at upload. That, that's just a short name mm -hmm. for you to download it by. This fingerprint is not the key itself. The key itself is much longer. Yeah. This is a cryptographic hash of it um, by a standard algorithm. Um, when you download the key using this ID, mm -hmm. um, it will tell you this and this and this. And you verify that they match. Yeah. It com your software is computing, recomputing the fingerprint from the bigger key it downloaded. Mm -hmm. um, and it should get the same answer. If the <laughs> bits, if, if all 2,000 bits of the key are the same, it will get the same 80-bit answer. Um, and the odds of it getting the same 80-bit answer um, for bit twiddling is arbitrarily small. Yeah. Not zero but so small that it's not a useful attack. Uh, the, the work to create a collision for a specific fingerprint uh, is astronomical. It is possible to create pairs of collisions that you can then have fun with, but I can't create a pair that includes the key he was going to use. I can create a pair um, and upload one claiming it's Federico's um, and then swap it and put in another one. Uh, and that does me no good at all. Because it's not the key he's actually going to use. Yeah, the it only just annoys people. Yeah, the only question is whether he's putting, he's signing his emails with that key or whether he just pastes in the fingerprint. Because if you just paste in the fingerprint, somebody... Oh yeah, I'm pasting the fingerprint in his key is not a cryptographic action. Yeah. Um, but... <coughs> having it pasted in every email that goes by any method, you can compare to see that everybody, all 400 websites that keep track of all of his emails, they all agree. 
If one of them disagrees, you don't trust that one. Unless there's someone between him and his internet connection. Well, then... Well, you can just call me up and ask me, you know, we off. Uh, <laughs> but, but, yeah, but, yeah. but the important thing is, you know, you'll have received it on yes. paper. Yes. Okay. And when you download the key from the server. Yeah, you can trust that. Yeah. Um, if this matches what's on the server, you trust that. Mm -hmm. And then his having it on his emails is just advisory. Yeah. You know, part of our procedure is going through this list, uh, each person verifying that it is correct, mm -hmm. and then you verifying uh, while we're doing that that your copy is the same as everyone else's. Yeah. Copy. So we'll, 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 we'll read this entire line, and John will verify that the line matches what he intended to upload, and everybody else will verify that it matches what's on their printout. Um, and that way we know that all the copies are the same. And, you know, in fact, some of the copies are different. <laughs> we have a confession that he actually printed twice. So we need to make sure that they are internally the same. Because who knows how many different print jobs there are. There might just be two here. They might be identical. They might not be. He, he might be throwing us a Mickey. Want me to pass them out? Uh, sure. Okay. That, that way people can see better than staring at this thing. Um, well, you notice that what you see here does not include anyone's email addresses. <laughs> that's cool. And that's, uh, that, that always ways to just keep spammers from scraping the addresses. There actually is a page that's not linked to anywhere that has all the addresses on them. Yeah. And that's what, uh, that's what Jerry printed. Ah. Uh, yeah, I just brought up my, I just logged into home and did a DPG mm -hmm. fingerprint. The thing about uh, what you were asking about Jabber putting his fingerprint, the short, uh, that is not cryptographic, but the reason why we do it, I do the same thing, is that by putting the information there, I typically don't sign my email and don't encrypt it. Mm -hmm. But if you receive an email from me, you know how to send me back and put the email. Because I'm saying this is the key, if you want to send me secure data, use this. That, that is his invitation to you to send him encrypted mail. Mm -hmm. Um, and if he can decrypt it, it proves it's the guy that sent the first one. Unless there's a man in the middle doing it both ways, changing it. But oh, I, I sent a, I replied to an encrypted mail, and the recipient can read it. Well, that could just be incompetence. <laughs> <laughs> it was my uh, Enig mail was misconfigured, and it was encrypting it with my key. <laughs> It was encrypting with your key instead of <coughs> with the public key. Sending it or to Will. Yeah. The uh, key thing with this public key cryptography is um, the uh, it is asymmetric. Um, the the uh, you use one key to um, send and a different key to receive, and it, it's. Un unlike normal cryptography. Um, this is a good thing. Um, normally publishing keys would be bad. Uh, but it does mean that the software has to be done right in order for things to work at all. So, line the first. Uh, this is Jabber's key, so Jabber will be verifying not on the paper, but on his authoritative copy. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is verifying on the paper. Okay, key ID is Dog 5 Charlie 7 Bravo 5 Dog 9. And it's Jabber. Mm -hmm. Fingerprint 72. Fox Bravo, three Niner, four Fox, three Charlie, three Bravo, dog six, three Bravo. No, that's five Bravo. Five Bravo, thank you. <laughs> Correct. Echo zero, Charlie eight, five Alpha, six Echo, Fox one, two Charlie, Bravo Echo, Niner Niner. That's correct. 
Everybody have that on the paper? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Size 1024 RSA. Mm -hmm. Is Andrew Engelbrecht here? Yes. Okay. Uh, you will be verifying off of your authoritative copy. How do I get the full fingerprint? Uh, you have the key there? Yes. Um, GPG dash dash fingerprint yeah, and okay, the key ID. Fingerprint. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Upload key ID is three niner bravo three six echo five eight. Yes. Fingerprint Delta Alpha Bravo four. Mm -hmm. Fox Niner eight niner. Echo two seven eight. 8 Bravo 8 Delta, Fox 058, Echo 0 Echo Fox, Echo Fox 1 Echo, Charlie 520, 3 Niner Bravo 3, 6 Echo 58. Correct. All good on paper? Yep. Yep. Size is 2048. <coughs> which is twice as paranoid as Java and RSA. <laughs> uh, really, Java, you should be doing a 248 RSA key next year. <laughs> 1024 is getting a little small for uh, uh, this yeah. decade. I think it's time to retire that key. Uh, yeah, which yeah. means you need to do the next one. You have to make sure your pen's not doing man in the middle attack. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> just <laughs> The, the 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 wisdom is that size may not last a decade. <laughs> um, Jerry, you're here. Yes. Line three. Okay. You have the authoritative copy. Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, your key ID is three Bravo Charlie one Echo Bravo nine or zero. That is correct. Your fingerprint is four nine or Echo two, Charlie five two Alpha. Fox Charlie 5 Alpha, Alpha 31 Fox, 8 Delta 6 6, Charlie 0 Alpha Fox, 7 Charlie Echo Alpha, 3 0 Fox Charlie, 3 Bravo Charlie 1, Echo Bravo 9 or 0. That is correct. Size 248 RSA, good choice. And Federico, you're here. Yes, sir. We have a JPEG image embedded in your key. Awesome. <laughs> uh, and five email addresses. Your authoritative source, your key ID was 4alpha73884 Charlie. Mm -hmm. Fingerprint, alpha273, 4fox57, 58charlie0. Seven Fox Echo Eight, Eight Three Eight Delta, Four Fox Eight Seven, Alpha Echo Echo Bravo, Echo Charlie One Eight, Four Alpha Seven Three, Eight Eight Four Charlie. Right. All good on paper. This one's only 1024 bits, but it's DSA, not RSA, which means it's using the um, discrete logarithms, which is a harder problem than the RSA problem, so 1024 is actually still good. Is Stephen Morth here? Yes. Ah, okay. Comrade Polar Bear suddenly makes sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> Your key ID is 143 Fox Bravo Niner Fox Ford. Is that correct on your authoritative copy? Yes, it is. Your fingerprint for your authoritative copy is Echo 066 7752 08 Niner 7. Yes. 5 Delta 5 Alpha. Yes. 41 Echo 1. Yes. Delta Delta Alpha Delta. Yes. Two Delta Fox three. Yes. Eight Delta eight three. Yes. One four three Fox. Yes. Bravo nine Fox four. Yes. 
and that's a nicely paranoid 4096 RSA. <laughs> that key should be good to, through the end of the decade and into the next decade. The five year, uh, five year expiration date. Five year expiration date is um, absurdly short for that size key. Um, but hey, uh, between now and the end of five years, you can create some more randomness. Um, Alexander Pennis. Is Alexander here? If Alexander is not here, we scratch key number six. Do not sign key number six. Once you've changed, I probably already signed. Well, uh, yes, yeah, signing is key at least three times already. But you so don't. Yeah. But you don't sign it again okay. tonight. Right. Yeah. Um, Correct. Will Rico? Yes. Ah, okay. Um, mm -hmm. Is Charlie six seven two two four Echo Bravo your key ID? Yes. Okay. On your authoritative copy, your fingerprint. Does it match? Seven zero Echo five, Fox six five two. Charlie eight three alpha four two echo five zero alpha fox five delta five alpha five Charlie alpha four four six eight alpha nine Charlie six seven two two four echo bravo. Yep. All good on paper, folks. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's no, just don't trust number six. Two zero four eight RSA. Okay, the next step, okay, and now for everybody except number six, you will now have a check mark in the, the key, key info it. spot because you have verified the key info with the owner of the key or the person purporting to be the owner of the key tonight and with the paper copy and everybody else's paper copy and the website. The next step is to check off the owner IDs, which you don't do now. What we're going to do is we're going to have a circular firing squad where we all have our sheet of paper and we all take out our photo ID. You all brought photo ID tonight because it said so on the registration email. Um, and we will turn the circle back in on itself so everybody walks by everybody and looks at each other's IDs and checks off the owner ID. Now this means you got to get up off your asses. For those of you that are on the list. <laughs> those of you who aren't on the list get to stay seated. Um, well, Mr. Number One. Jabber here. Andrew. Right here. Spot number two. Gary, spot number three. Who's the Freddy? busy working on this stuff. <laughs> um, and now, if you would... Wrap around. No? Just, just, oh, okay. just walk, walk, walk down the line. Well, Gary was here. Yeah, I know. You want me to go swim? It's kind of a hard one. <laughs> In a Java shoot suit. <laughs> I'll get my passport. That'd be good. Are you still you? Yeah, I'm still me. This one. John Matthew. Mm -hmm. 
Even in though relation to a door is saying Brett. Not to my knowledge. Hey, wait, yeah, I probably asked class. you that before. Okay, I'm going to sign you off here. Well, I look like this in the corner. What does Lisa Frady mean? Lucy Frady? Yeah. Uh, means afraid of the dark. <laughs> I don't know what you call it here. It's uh, it's a derivative of some German writer in the 8th century. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> A larger group would have folded in the middle and just kept going, but you have another idea? Oh, sure. I, I don't really need to stand up here anymore. They're going to see you right in yeah. yeah, you can sit down. <coughs> You're dismissed. <laughs> And, and if you don't like Comrade Bear's yeah, yeah. Um, ID, you don't have to sign his ID. <laughs> he discriminates. I don't like his ID, I just don't like him. <laughs> well, there's that problem too. But I don't trust someone who shaved his head. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there is a method um, that where everyone has to print up their own version, yeah. but you can like do the hash of it and then put the hash up on the board and then just yep. verify the hash. Uh, there are mm. other ways of doing it. Yeah. But I don't have access to my own printer, so I think it's pretty good. Next up, and, and th it's also possible to, uh, you know, everybody has slips of paper. Yeah. Okay. I have to hand those out. Yeah. 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 And, oh, and, and it looks like an MIT bulletin board. <laughs> in the past, I like how that looks. Sure. There'd okay. always be somebody who <laughs> didn't actually <laughs> upload their really keys. Yeah. So yeah. So so there'd be a page. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I yeah. kind of haven't had that tonight. Right. Uh -huh. I thought that you were. Oh, so the wind, so the we used to we used to do it manually. Yeah, that was <laughs> okay. <laughs> just, we just write everything down. And and, and, uh -huh. and you know, know was, I, I, but then I there's also you used can used put up a fake key uh, that no one uses and see Riker if people sign it. Picture <laughs> and then that it. will tell you if someone just signs that key. Or regardless of right. Lieutenant Rico. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, what I do oh. is yes. bug uh, Mr. Rico. Bug. We have a script that. We've been using the last few years. Yeah, so Essentially, what I'll do is so I'll yeah, email you that that was, an encrypted um, me putting a ring in there. It's a good thing no about ASCII about. key. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't do everything. What? what? The script doesn't do everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's about CAFF. What's that? CAFF. It's, uh, what? I forget what the CA stands for. It's CA Fire and Forget. So it's like you just type in the keys, the IDs, and it like downloads them from the key server. You just verify, and then it'll Yeah, that's basically what my script did. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, CAF. You still have to go through each one and verify it. Yeah, you do. Yeah. But it automates I, I can never get the whole thing right. automated at the end, so I'd still have to keep typing in the damn passphrase every time. <laughs> yeah. So, my well, script would create a batch of some When, when, when you get home okay. on a trusted network connection, probably shouldn't do it on the network connection here when the other people are in the room, but I suppose you could. Um, this is MIT. There's always going to be some man in the middle <laughs> <laughs> or girl. It but there would have to be a collision of some sort. Yeah. So which is unlikely. Well, which is rather unlikely. Mm -hmm. You um, go back to the server that you uploaded your key to, according to the instructions, mm -hmm. and download by the key IDs um, all of the keys that you have checked off on your list, yeah. regenerate the fingerprint, match it to what's on your trusted paper copy, and you know go over the letters one at a time, back and forth, yeah. Uh, you know, getting your girlfriend to read the paper copy to you might make it easier, uh, except she'll kill you. Um, <laughs> so you got to move the eyes back and forth and refocus at different distances and different brightnesses, and it's a pain. <laughs> Sorry. Um, although you could 
No. If you downloaded it from the website, then you'd have to compare the website to your paper, trusted paper copy, and then compare the two on the computer. So don't do that. Because the trusted paper copy is the only trusted information you have. That is where the trust in those IDs comes from. But once you sign it, you know, at that point, you should be. Yes, you transfer the trust yeah. from the check marks on your piece of paper to the bits after you've matched the fingerprint that you've locally generated. Mm -hmm. And then you immediately use the signing option with your private key, which you unlock with your passphrase. Your private key is locked under a passphrase, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Very long one. You know, uh, if your passphrase is P4SSPHR4S3, that's not good. Neither is horse staple. But a horse staple whale, that's pretty good. Um, that's an XKCD joke. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Now, it says if the fingerprint match, sign the key. Well, th there's a second if here. If you are happy with, if you're still happy with having put an ID check mark on the piece of paper, you're making a value decision either at the time you make the ID check mark or later when you look at your piece of paper, do you really believe that? Jabber is jabber, and comrade polar bear is comrade polar bear. Yeah, um, Manchurian candidate. And, and <laughs> the uh, um, that that is a value judgment. Um, and if, if both of those are true, sign it. Um. Then. You take the signed version of the key you downloaded and encrypt it using the key that you just signed um, as the public encryption key. This means that only the person who actually holds the private key with that fingerprint and decrypt it. Not just any key with that fingerprint, but the key that generated the big thing that that's the fingerprint of. Uh, so that your having signed it will not go to somebody else um, that maybe shouldn't have it. I don't see the problem. <laughs> problem there, but this, this verifies it can get, get into the wild later after, if they upload it, that's fine. They are announcing your, your trust in them. This is a good thing. But this is how you validate their email. Um, the, uh, uh, and you email it to one of the email addresses listed um, in the key. The, typically the first one. Um, and that way it verifies that that really is their email address because they'll only get it if they get email there. Um, and they have the private key to unencrypt it. And this will be a very slow encryption because this is actually encrypting uh, using the RSA algorithm. Mm -hmm. Does it use a nonce key under? I don't know the PGP protocol. As we get to larger search sizes, they better be. <laughs> oh, I oh. see what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I have a script for automating this, uh, this part of the process. There's one part of it that I had always intended to do but never figured out how. And that was to have, uh, if, if a key had multiple uh, email addresses, I wanted to sign just one email address and send uh, the encrypted key to that address. And, and do each one separately. Yeah. But I couldn't find any way of doing that. Uh. I think CAS does, FS does that. 
What's the part that you cannot do? I mean, I, I, I could sign just one address on it and then send it to that one address. But then when yeah. I go to sign the next address, there's already a signature on the first address. Can and you I sign each different address? I think you can, right? Yeah, but they're all sitting on the same key ring. So when you go to sign that second address, the first address is already signed. So there must be some switch to select UID that you're signing. Yeah. Uh, I never, I never figured out how to get this to work. It's, uh, I want to have just the one uh, uh, email address, uh, just the one UID uh, being signed when I send when I email it out to that address. So there's an alternative protocol, um, which has. Um, signing a challenge with the key you've signed, mailing that to the email address, and having them send back um, an answer to the challenge encrypted with the private key um, that you can decrypt with the public key that you've signed. And only then do you release um, the key that you've signed by uploading it to a public server. But sending the signed key as the challenge message to the person and they upload it is a whole heck of a lot easier. <laughs> and there, there, there's problems that uh, you know, if we'd had a lot of people uh, getting everybody to check everybody's thing, A would have to have folded the line and then continually gone in the circle. Um, but, you know, it takes n squared time, or n squared over two if you look at each other's at the same time, uh, which for a really large group is a pain, and there are, there are ways of dealing with that. Um, but we don't have any of that problem. <laughs> so the net result is everybody trusts everybody, and then it is possible um, to decide that you are willing to trust a key that is signed by a key you recognize. So that if somebody that Jabber and Jerry and Federico all signed last year or the year before or the year before that, um, you haven't see, ever seen their key before, but their key on the public server is signed by these three dudes whose keys you have seen, the faces you've seen. Um, you can choose to trust that one. And that's, uh, you know, trust is not transitive. Um, doesn't have to be, but... Um, there are two different kinds of trust here. Trusting that he is who he says he is, and then trusting that he's uh, careful enough to verify people's IDs when he signs them. And, and, and careful enough um, not to leave the private key without a passphrase on an exposed hard drive. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, you, know, you, can, you can have start a really big fight about whether the uh, single only copy of the key should be on a flash drive or a hard drive. And you know what do you do for a safety backup? Yeah. Um, you know, maybe one copy in a secure flash drive that you'll never lose, and a second copy in a secure flash drive in a safety deposit box. I don't know. You, you, but you can start fights by talking about how to protect the key. You can also have a hex dump printed on a paper. If that's the only copy left, it's a real pain to type it in, but at least... The uh, a hex copy open. in the safety deposit box might be a good thing in two sealed envelopes. Why two? Um, the outer envelope says nothing uh, except the code word that will remind you what's in it. And the inner envelope says, don't open this. Mm -hmm. Now, standard classified material handling procedures, double envelopes, the outer envelope says return to this post office box, the inner envelope says classified above your level, don't open, uh, <laughs> return to the out address on the outer envelope, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> under, under penalty of law, FBI take notice. But you have to open it. <laughs> um, 
No, you just mail it to WikiLeaks and let them open. It. <laughs> um, but you know, the, the smart people um, who know that lives are depending on this have thought about these sort of protocols. And if you're hand carrying classified, it is um, double sealed um, at a minimum and properly marked. Uh, where properly is depends on the classification and where you're going and how. And this is why uh, various um, government shops, the buildings have tubes between them. Because if you walked across the parking lot with a folder under your arm, you'd have to double seal it to go across the parking lot. But if there's a tube between the buildings, you're not leaving the building. Unless they pull back the uh, perimeter from one building because the cafeteria has been overrun by kindergarten families for the day. fun stuff. Um, the NSA has public stuff in the pub info declassified area of their website. Uh, they have a 1938 instruction manual on military cryptanalysis in four PDFs. This was the training material uh, for a new uh, cipher breaker. Um, being trained during the uh, run-up to World War II and you know, pretty late in World War II, this would be you know, class one. <coughs> um, the uh, that that training manual was uh, you know the, the only improvement on uh, Riverside Labs um, materials uh, available in, in the the first half of the 20th century, and it was only declassified in, I think, 2005. You know, anything in it was probably obsolete by then, long since. Anything, in, anything covered in the 1938 manual uh, was probably obsolete for practical purposes uh, by the end of the war, just a lot of people didn't know it yet. You might wonder why the cracking of Enigma was kept so secret at the end of the war. Um, the Brits sold all the captured Enigma machines uh, to their former colonies as they gave them freedom. The Swiss government, or a company in Switzerland with the blessing of the Swiss government, uh, sold reproduction Enigmas to police departments and governments all over the world, not just in the developing world, all through the 50s. So any government that knew about the break in Enigma could read any of that traffic that was believed secure by everybody else. So until those machines were obsoleted by computers, um, the, the break of Enigma had to be still secret, very secret. Um, the fact that of all the machine ciphers, Enigma basically is, you know, just another odometer with, you know, funky wheels with letters instead of numbers. Uh, of all the machines of that style uh, created in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, it was the most prolific and the most crap. Um, the, uh, the American one was uh, much more secure. Um, there was active academic work trying to break it today. The, the machine that our government used in World War II and not really the same role, somewhat the same role as Enigma, but more the same role as 
the tunnier fish ciphers um, for the Germans, um, which were also broken. Um, it is still of academic interest today because it was that much better than its uh, competitors in the day. This is the <laughs> description of that uh, German uh, one-time pad system that I mentioned earlier. And there's General Pemberton. <laughs> Absolutely not the case. Um, the uh, but uh, the, the code talkers were operating at a echelon of command where the Japanese probably had broken everything else that was in use. Mm. Um, the code talkers were being used tactically, you know, from different parts of one island. To each other, or from the island back out to the ship, uh, so that uh, you know, if you're expecting a corporal or a sergeant uh, to use an encryption system and destroy it before he's killed or captured, it's going to be damn simple and one that you can replace um, overnight uh, when it is captured because somebody carrying it turns up missing at roll call and it's probably face down in a ditch and you don't know if his pocket's been gone from. Um, and th these are typically called trench ciphers from World War I uh, usage. And they're simple. Um, and the point is that the, any message sent in a trench cipher uh, isn't useful to break it if it takes you more than a day to break it uh, because the tactical situation has moved on. Uh, you only send information in it that has a uh, intelligence lifetime of a few hours uh, because if the enemy intercepts it, there's a fair chance they can break it. Um, it just is going to take them enough time to get it up the chain of command to the guy who's figured out how to break it um, and he's already broken it and he decrypts it and sends it, the information back through their trench cipher to somebody who um, can take advantage of knowing what you were going to do two hours ago oh you already did it, never mind. Um, so that you don't need a cipher that's much more complex uh, than what um, seventh graders use uh, to pass love notes uh, because it doesn't have to protect the information much longer. Uh, a a um, advance in the hill country lasts about as long as a seventh grade romance. Fair enough. Um, one of the things that we used to do in Vietnam would be to I used to have to send news articles down to the battalion headquarters. And I was instructed to encrypt for transmission only. And every once in a while, the sergeant that did that would uh, classify it. Oops. Um, Which used to get some people in trouble. Yeah. I Frankly, uh, if it was going in a good encryption system, mm -hmm. news articles would be a very bad thing because you saw what we could do just knowing the word river would be in there someplace. Mm -hmm. If you compared 
Yeah. The radio traffic um, from your unit um, to, to wherever against the AP wire, if you were sending AP wire stories yeah. um, encrypted for transmission only on your link, um, somebody comparing against current wire story at the same length. And you know, it's fairly easy to measure the length of an article. Yeah. Um, the, um, you know, if even, even the computer um, uh, that uh, handled your spare parts could have counted the number of letters in an AP wire copy and the number of letters in a mm -hmm. radio message and said, oh, this one's the same mm -hmm. length. Yep. Um, let's check and see if that story... Well, I mean, the famous, you know, the famous thing of how we started to decrypt the Japanese code was with the Battle of Midway. Well, that, that was a code, not a cipher. Yeah. Um, and there was a, um, a after we cracked the cipher, there were code words mm -hmm. embedded in the cipher. Right. And there was a code word for place yeah. that we weren't certain um, was midway. Yeah. meant midway. We thought it must be from the tactical strategic situation. Yeah. So we intentionally transmitted a bogus message in a cipher we knew the Japanese had broken, but they didn't know we'd broke. They didn't know we knew they'd broken it, because we'd broken another message where they, we, we'd broken a cipher where they talked about reading our traffic on such and such a net, so we knew they were reading it. <coughs> so we intentionally sent a message uh, that said the water plant, the desalination plant that makes fresh water out of seawater at Midway was busted. And sure enough, on this uh, Japanese encrypted network, there's a message to the fleet that says the desalination plant at station code word is broken, yep. which filled in that mm -hmm. one blank in our code book of their code words, which confirmed the presumed meaning of the message that says, we're attacking Midway on such and such a date, which is why our carriers left and were hanging around pretending to go someplace else entirely. Mm -hmm. um, our carriers pretended to fall for the feint uh, against the illusions that the Japanese master plan was to feint against the illusions to draw us off and then grab Midway with the main force. So being wise to their plan, um, our carriers pretended to go herring off after the feint but instead we're just a little bit beyond radar distance. Um, and so when the Japanese got within radar distance of the island, the island says, oh, there's folks here. And the carriers do not break radio silence, launch planes, um, go look for Japanese carriers. We pound the crap out of the Japanese carriers while the Japanese are pounding the crap out of Midway with their planes. And their planes come home and go, crap, where am I supposed to land? <laughs> um, and they land, and the Admiral Double Futz is trying to decide, does he reload to bomb the island again, or does he reload to go bomb the carriers that must be out there someplace, because we just got bombed by planes that don't land on islands, um, so that our second wave catches his planes on deck reloading with bombs all over the deck. This was a very bad day for Japanese naval aviation. Yep. Turning point of the war in the Pacific, really. Yeah, it really was. Four carriers to one, I think. No. And, and one of those carriers was one that they thought they'd sunk. Yeah. And we ran back to um, Pearl, fixed it up, and got it back out there in time for the next battle. I think the Lexington was scuttled. Yeah, the, the La Lady Lex was sunk the second time at Midway. Oh, mm -hmm. I see what you mean. <laughs> they thought they'd already sunk her. Yeah. Um, and, and the, the Solomons, was it the Solomons or? Uh, 
Battle of the Coral City. And um, she was. Very good sound she, she she was put together. Mm -hmm. you know, it was pretty close to a uh, bailing wire job. They did a very fast repair turnaround and got her back because we knew when the Battle of Midway was going to be because we were reading their messages. We knew what the deadline was, and they told Pearl Harbor guys, "All right, you've got." X weeks to fix this thing so it's ready to go back into battle again. The guy said, what? You're crazy. <laughs> um, you're, you're, you're working um, 12 on, 12 off shifts until it's done, but you get double desserts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it got done. I would like to see the captain of that ship. It's like, well, I know they used a lot of bailing wire, but I'm going to take it back in the battle. Yeah. <coughs> um, so the we spoke earlier about the theoretically unbreakable one-time pad. <coughs> um, it has been invented separately, repeatedly, because the first seven people to invent it didn't publish or published it in obscure places. Um, the um, cryptographer working for the British uh, Special Operations Executive SOE um, deduced it based on the introduction to cryptography course he got um, coming in as an accountant being said, okay, you're good at crosswords, you're a cryptographer now. <laughs> uh, and he designed the codes for the agents being dropped in Europe. And he had to break the messages from his agents in Europe when they made a mistake in encryption. Sometimes it's easier to decrypt a mangled message by attacking it as a cryptanalyst rather than trying to work it out with the normal procedures. So he'd have to do that because asking an agent behind Nazi lines to resend their last, to re-encipher and resend their last transmission is asking them to risk their life again because you know, there are radar homing stations tracking them every time they transmit. Um, and people looking for people sneaking around in the dark. So you really need to minimize the number of retransmissions. So he would take a garbled message that couldn't be properly deciphered by the cipher clerks using the standard rules and work out how they mangled the encipherment to figure out what the message was. Um, but he figured that, okay, if a if reusing a key is bad, either in the same message by repeating it, like Manchester Bluff, Manchester Bluff, Manchester Bluff, or um, reusing a key that's very long between two messages, so you can subtract the two messages to get the, the which gets rid of the random long key and gets you two natural language things and ciphered against each other. Uh, since both of those were bad, what you really needed was an infinitely long random key that you'd never reuse, which you then had to just smuggle a copy of to the agent. And he invented the one-time pad. Um, a couple of guys at Bell Labs are given credit in American engineering uh, annals because they uh, invented it and it was sort of uh, in the engineering literature so they're called Burnham codes in our literature uh, but it was recently discovered by computer scientist uh, Steve Bellavan that during the telegraphy era good old Morse code beep, 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 uh, wireline telegraphy uh, many commercial code books were published not so much for secrecy but to drive down the cost of telegrams. Western Union and its international partners charged monopoly rent on every telegram sent. Uh, what they charge by the word makes what you're paying for um, Comcast look reasonable. Okay? Um, you know, they, they were basically charging by the byte, not by the gigabyte. Uh, so people would use code books for compression. You'd have a code word um, that meant buy all the apples available. 
and another code word that says buy blank cases of eggs large and another code word for buy blank cases of eggs medium these code books get pretty long and they were available in stationer's stores and public libraries there was no secrecy from the code the code was just to compress um, a whole sentence or paragraph into five or seven alphabetic characters in a uh, pronounceable consonant vowel pattern. So it had to be pronounceable to go with the low rate on the telegraph. If it was unpronounceable, you paid the higher price. Um, so, but there, there was always a little section at the back of the code book that said if you wish secrecy, um, you can use the following procedure to add an offset um, to the characters or numbers um, of the code. Or, and so there might be pronounceable um, letter keywords um, and a sequence of numbers uh, for each item. Uh, and you could use the numbers and add a magic translator number to all of the numbers of your message and then look up the re resulting number, adding without carry or adding with carry, and throw away the final carry out if it goes off to too long. And then look up that number in the book and send the code word that matches the translated number. And you subtract <laughs> the number from the number for the code word you receive and look up that number to get the um, real code word to get the real meaning of the message you receive. Uh, and this was considered secure by people that didn't understand how you'd uh, break codes and ciphers, but if you have any idea what they're sending, you can figure out what the super encipherment is fairly easily. People who cared then came up with fancier super encipherments, yada, 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 um, and turns out a guy named Frank Miller actually included in the frontispiece of his commercial code book um, which was uh, published for banks <laughs> in the Northeast. Uh, a one-time pad system uh, where you come up with tables of random numbers uh, that you make up by throwing dice or pulling uh, Scrabble chits out of a bucket or whatever um, and send one copy to your agent in Syracuse. Uh, and do this for each agent that you have. Um, and you could use those non-reusable additives um, to protect your code words, and you scratch them out when you use them. He didn't mention burning them because he wasn't assuming anyone's going to burgle your desk. He didn't even recommend locking your desk. Um, they're just you know, worried about the telegraph clerk selling copies of your message to the other bank. Uh, and that is the oldest known independent invention of the one-time pad, which raises the question, since it was published, and they've actually found a copy in a public library, and at Bellavin's request, Google scanned it in from the New York Public Library. It wasn't on Google Books until Bellavin requested, hey, this book that I need is in the catalog of that library where you have a Google Books kiosk set up. Could you please prioritize this one to help my research? Um, but it was floating around. This raises the question, did Vernum and what's his name at Bell Labs were they aware of this people and paper one-time pad when they invented the paper tape one-time pad in the 30s? We don't know. The other bit of news out in the real world and cryptography. You may have heard of the Beale cipher. Um, back in the early 1800s, somebody published three cipher texts um, that claimed 
um, to document where a ma wonderful treasure looted during our Revolutionary War was buried in West Virginia. Um, and it was announced with these that document one or two, one of the documents, the key to the cipher was the, uh, I think the Declaration of Independence, where the number in the cipher is the number of words from the beginning of the document, and the first letter of the numbered word is the letter to replace that number with. So this is a homophone cipher. You have many different ways of saying E, so you can't tell uh, that which uh, letter or number is E because there are more ways of saying E than um, so that it, it mutes the statistics. Um, and supposedly, you know, other documents are the keys for the other two um, enciphered documents. Um, and they may have solved the third document, but they've never solved the one that says where the treasure is. But the documents they do have the plain text for um, give some redundant information to what would be in the document we can't read. The document we can't read has some numbers that are higher than the number of words in the Declaration of Independence. Um, but there are strings of numbers in it that are all lower than the number of words in the Declaration of Independence. And for those, using the Declaration of Independence um, makes uh, reasonable nonsense. And so the conclusion of um, this guy, Peschel, um, is that the um, it's actually a hoax. Um, and there are numbers too big to the Declaration of Independence thrown in to convince you it's not based on the Declaration of Independence. And he was you know, making up random numbers there. But he used Declaration of Independence numbers uh, based on the way he did the other document. Um, for most of it. And so it, it, it's, it, he's getting a statistical angle that is strongly suggestive that there's no there there. Uh, so it's an interesting negative result. Um, also in the world of uh, old fashioned manual ciphers, you've probably heard of the solitaire cipher. Um, which Neil Stevenson book was it? Snow Crash? Uh, Not one I read. What, one of the um, uh, one of the cyberpunk authors posits the world goes to hell in a handbasket. You can't trust your uh, computer or your phone to do encryption for you because it's going to rat think <laughs> to the evil corporations that run the planet because uh, we let them outlaw uh, open source software and um, you know real cryptography. How does encryption now? It was in Cryptonomicon, well, as it should. I don't think it was Snow Crash. Yeah, he, he says it's Cryptonomicon. He Googled or Wiki. Uh, um, Bruce Schneier has an Oh, yes. Well, well, Bruce Schneier was actually the consultant for it. One of the um, best living open source cryptographers on the planet, um, Bruce Schneier, was actually consulted by the science fiction author. Um, and came up with an algorithm using a deck of cards as a um, feedback shift register um, by assigning basically letter values um, to the uh, cards. There are 13 cards in a suit. There are 26 letters in the alphabet. There are two colors of cards. So you have two alphabets. Um, you add four jokers to the deck um, as uh, control cards. Um, and by a certain manipulation of the deck, 
you generate a letter that you can then add to the letter of your message using um, you know, the, sort of the, the standard grid combinator of um, alphabet at the top, alphabet on the side, diagonal rows of letters. Um, and as long as your deck starts in the same condition as your recipient's deck, they will generate the same sequence if they follow the algorithm correctly. And they can subtract the letters they pull out of their deck uh, to get the message. Um, and the good news is there is not a way to reconstruct the history of the deck by looking at the deck. So e the algorithm goes forward, but it doesn't go back. So even if the police get to see your deck when they bust you, they can't read the messages you sent. Um, and it, it's wicked cool. There is active academic uh, investigation of this algorithm. They found that it has a slight bias, and they're looking at whether it's crackable, and if they come up with a solution, we'll have to come up with a better card counting method. But that's a way to do computer grade cryptography without a computer if you've got plenty of time and are really, really good at following instructions. <laughs> um, and that is the only paper and pencil method which is considered secure. Um, Steve Gibson of uh, Gibson Research, the makers of um, Spinrite, the uh, hard drive repair tool, and a couple of security tools, um, and a co-host of the Security Now podcast, highly recommended, um, recently came up with a paper cipher which is computer generated. You print out a grid of letters um, that you can keep in your wallet or a safety deposit box uh, that can be used to hash a web address to a password. So if you want absolutely secure passwords for your online services um, that you don't have to figure out a way to remember, um, you can use this grid um, which is initialized with a truckload of entropy and then you um, set, use some of that entropy to initial do the initial um, Value. Basically, you trace a crossword as an acrostic of the letters of the domain into the grid, and then for some number of letters, and then start tracing the name of it again, um, picking off the letters you stop on um, to create the password. Having used the first six or whatever 12 letters of the um, web name gets you to a quasi-random starting point in the grid, and then you uh, follow left down, left up, 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 and spiraling for the letters. It's basically a magic square or a uh, queen's puzzle of the letters. So the letters of the alphabet are highly scrambled in the grid. So, th so there's always one E up and down from where you are, and always one E left and right. You just alternate between vertical and horizontal transitions to get to the next letter of the name, and the letter you pass over so many letters on the way is the letter you take for the password. And as long as your sheet is secure, uh, and nobody knows what sheet you printed, uh, there is no way to back out um, what password you would choose uh, for www.google.com. Um, and you could use this to, to make up the password that you stick in last pass, or you could uh, use it because you're not going to bother to even stick in last pass uh, the uh, password you use to bid in the WGBH auction. But if you decide to bid again next year, you might want to recreate the same password. This will let you reproduce it. Interesting, interesting idea. Um, letting LastPass do its own cryptographic um, computation and save it 
uh, is probably good enough if you always use it. But okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs>